actually it's time for demystifying payments which is the next panel the first couple of months of the lockdown were rough for individuals businesses and the digital payments industry i uh, like how shall said raise pay themselves saw a 30% drop in payment volumes in the first two three months of the pandemic but things have changed and changed fast and now consumers and businesses are flocking to online payments will time stay the same or change i don't know i'm certain i'm certain that and so we have the right people from the payments bodies uh, to banks to new credit companies to discuss the rise in digital payments during the pandemic and what it means for the next billion users on board it digitally please join me on welcoming uh, with uh, in the welcoming on stage uh, pravina rai the chief operating officer of the npci nitin gupta founder and ceo of uni Sanjeev Gadgil, head of sales employed in segment and e-commerce for ICICI Bank. Sanjeev Monghe, EVP and head for Cards and Payments, uh, Axis Bank. And the panel will be moderated by Arpit Chub, uh, the chief financial officer of Raytheon. Enjoy. Hey Arpit, we'll get the rest of the panelists on quickly, and you guys can kick off. Thanks, Anand. Hi. I think um hi everyone uh, um i think uh, i think we are uh, um, uh, waiting for pankaj uh, uh, you know he's facing some technical challenges but uh, uh, we'll we get started and uh, i'm sure pankaj will uh, join us in a in a couple of minutes uh, really uh, you know uh, delighted to be moderating this uh, you know panel right we've got uh, you know leadership from top banks uh, npci Uh, entrepreneur who's founded payments and lending companies so i'm i'm looking forward to this uh, this this discussion and i'm going to you know jump right in uh, you know the hope uh, today is to you know the you know the digital payments ecosystem is rapidly evolving and you know from experts like you you know i i, I we want to hear what it could look like in the coming years right that's what we are hoping to kind of uh, get to the bottom of if i can if i can try and do that uh, Uh, so so let me let me jump right into it uh, and uh, sanjeev i want to you know start off with you uh, about a question on 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 digital payments and currency uh, you know we've seen massive gains in digital payments over the last uh, you know few years right just just last month i think uh, you know npci reported on upi in aggregate peer to peer and peer to merchant there was 50 billion dollars worth of uh, transactions right however in the same period you know currency in circulation also keeps going up right we keep seeing gains on currency uh, you know uh, every every 5 6 months when rbi releases those numbers uh, i know harshil in the morning talked about how cash on delivery dropped in april may but went back up again uh, you know what is it that you know needs to happen you know structurally in terms of either awareness or accessibility that if i can use the word help us win this war against cash Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, I'm visible and audible. Yeah. Yeah. With that, I'll move ahead. Uh, see, okay. Uh, just I, I'll get to the answer, but I think the first thing we should get right is there is no war against cash. Cash is not bad. I think, and obviously, it's coming from a bank. But uh, we should just get the first thing right. Cash drives the economy. Cash is a form of money, right? You can have credit card in the form of money. It can be credit card. It can be UPI. It can be Uh, well, the money in your bank, which you can transfer through IMPs, you can well transfer it in the form of physical currency, which is cash. Uh, cash by itself is not bad. There are fairly large economies which run pretty well on cash. Uh, Germany and Japan are two names at least which come to my mind right now. So it's not bad per se. If some of the other things that we know come with cash, cash means largely it's black. It's not uh, the formal cash, the white cash, etc. One, two, if your cash, uh, if your tax to GDP ratios are low. those are issues that we should actually be talking about so largely not necessarily in the purview of payments but i just want all of us to understand that cash by itself is not uh, bad second obviously cash is growing now i have seen the data obviously last 2 3 years cash has been growing uh, in fact if you were to look at cash as one data point and second digital payments it has actually grown faster than digital payments having said that if you were to because digital payments as when we look at it today comprises obviously the largest stuff out there is rtgs so keep it up Let's talk about retail payments. Within retail payments, obviously there are some forms which are going up and kind of up and down, etc. This year, for example, plastic payments may not necessarily grow at the 25-30 percent pace it used to. Debit card used to grow 18-20, credit card used to grow 30 or thereabouts. UPI, on the other hand, is going through a very different pace of growth. IMPs continues to grow, of course. Sir. UPI, one way to look at it is at the back end it's IMPs, but I'm just keeping UPI and IMPs separate. So these forms are growing uh, at the for sure. Now, if your question is, what should be done to drive 
further growth on this i think one part in india is the pyramid still needs to be expanded let's understand the product which is most widely pervasive out of all the retail payments which are digital it would be one debit card and two upi debit card would be approximately 55 to 60 crore penetration in india today what is the usage in let's say the bottom 20 30 crore is still very very limited second part if you were to look at upi by pravina will have the data my sense it's close to 20 crore individuals there are more upi handles out there but in terms of individuals my sense it must be around 20 crore which means there is still a large part which is out there which is not using digital now is it because they don't want to is it because they are not conversant it is because they don't have the medium to be able to use this i think these are questions that with we have to get down to answering but uh, it never get answered in a two minute uh, reply to a question uh, but first thing there is no war against cash two digital payments make it easier uh, we also have to form uh, form the security challenge so in case people believe cash somehow seems to be more secure than uh, digital if he faces fraud issues i think these there are these pieces to be solved and good part at least of security is between the representatives in the field plus the regulator rbi we have been very very proactive india today has high security standards and quite a few advanced countries uh, and uh, that is pretty good but a uh, lot of steps required which i am saying go into the security how convenient is it and then where does he use it all of these have to be solved for uh, to grow digital payments at a ratio faster than cash that's the message no, no, great thoughts right absolutely that uh, the intent of uh, you know driving digital payments faster than cash and uh, pravina i want to kind of hear your thoughts on that right that obviously upi has in the last you know few years uh, and you know in particular in the last 6 uh, to 9 months uh, just shown uh, the, the the potential of growing month after month and some of this uh, you know sustaining significantly post uh, you know post covid as well if i can use the term uh, your thoughts on what's next out there which could which could accelerate you know this curve even faster thank you arpit and great points by by sanjeev you know i i completely am i'm missing with uh, the points that he made um, and uh, given the period of the pandemic you know which is not a short period of time i truly believe that users who got onboarded onto digital payments in this period Uh, are going to continue to stay users. Of course, you know, a few of them will fall back, but largely, I think we have crossed a point where it is just a, just a few days, just a few weeks. It's actually a few months. Uh, we'll be hitting close to a year very soon. Uh, plus, we have users who used to use, uh, you know, mediums like UPI on a on a limited basis, and now they are using it intensely. Right, many more use cases, more online uh, shop for the grocer, weather delivery, you know, pay uh, using uh, UPI, so on and so forth. so this of course uh, the trend will continue uh, but there is more work to be done in terms of enabling the awareness around how people get more comfortable with with using this for all their requirements so today as, as sanjeev said you know somebody still taking some cash in the wallet you need to carry your wallet i mean have you reached a point where you just walk out with your phone i think that's the point that's the golden moment right so it needs to have ubiquity so we need more penetration more merchants more qr codes more online solutions uh, we need people to be more comfortable in you know, how to use upi safely um, or any any digital payment right what are the safety parameters as we get these uh, large new tranche of users who coming digital into payments after the initial euphoria they do have to know how to use upi safely how to use a card safely what's an otp what's a pin you know what do you Uh, not share and and why it's important to not share. So those elements, uh, the awareness elements of safety are uh, are important as we move forward. Uh, and uh, we need to look at uh, the awareness of the beauty of many of these payment uh, systems is the uh, what we call the interoperability, which means you pick any app, you pick any bank app, you know any uh, any non bank app, and you are able to make the payment to anybody uh, who could have an account anywhere in the system. So I think some of that awareness is. Uh, that journey is still in pro- in in progress uh, people might still be thinking that i need to have the same uh, kind of app to be able to make a payment so i think we still have work to do on the awareness side there's work to do on the uh, reach and penetration and there are many more bastions of cash uh, you know to be addressed so what's the problem statement why is cash still used here uh, and not to say cash is bad right but taking it away creates efficiency you know creates Uh, convenience creates uh, in the long run inclusion because it implies uh, transactions being available for you know either credit or you know any other kind of 
uh, formal mechanisms of bringing more people into the into the financial system. So all those benefits are there, and that's why we come to things like transit. You know, we 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 have solutions, but I think the uh, the ubiquity of that. You know, we are we are we are far away from saying you know I can get into a bus, I can get into a train. You know, I can use my phone or my card, and I'm and I'm done. We are not there. We are nowhere there, right? We're just taking some baby steps. Uh, and there are many more bastions of of cash that are still there, which need to be solved for. They need to be solved for. They also need to be uh, addressed and implemented. Um, so I think it's still, you know, we've done. Uh, the story is looking very good, uh, but a lot more to do. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Sanjeev and uh, Pravina for sharing these thoughts. Uh, very, you know, uh, uh, very very interesting and uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, I think importance of cash, uh, you know, and its value in the system is there uh, and. Uh, uh, but a lot more can be driven, uh, and, and a lot more convenience can be driven, uh, you know, through digital payments. Uh, let me now uh, maybe shift gears a bit and talk about, you know, the form factor within digital payments. Uh, uh, I think Pankaj has also, uh, you know, joined us. So, uh, Pankaj, uh, you know, welcome, welcome to the panel. Uh, uh, hi, Arpit. Hi. Uh, am I audible, Arpit? Yeah, 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 Pankaj, we can hear you. Te te technical glitch. I'm extremely sorry. No, no worries. Uh, welcome. Welcome. So, hi, Arpit. Hi, Sanjeev. So, so I'm, um, so you know, so moving from moving from that, I want to talk about form factor within, uh, you know, within within digital payments, right? And you know, I think world over, particularly in the developed markets, right? You know, cards were the dominant, uh, uh, you know, digital payment uh, instrument. And uh, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, with with the success that UPI has seen, right? You know, convenience of uh, you know these real time payment systems, and so many buy now pay pay later options, right? You're kind of getting both the Convenience of real time, the convenience of credit. If I can say, uh, will you know, will cards as a you know form factor not see the success that it has seen in other parts of the world? Nitin, I, I you know I know you have big plans for cards, so let me direct this question to you. Thanks, thanks, Alpert. Um Great question. So, so first of all, let me differentiate between credit cards and debit cards, uh, and let me start with some statistics. So in credit cards, I remember way back in 2015, uh, about 35%, one third of spends used to be online and two thirds of spends used to be on credit cards offline. Uh, and if I pull out data for earlier this year, Jan, Feb, right, I think that number is now close to 50-50. 50% of the spends are online and 50% of the spends are offline. That's one data. Let me share with you another data. If you look at average spends of a buy now, pay later, or let's say, let's say you were to issue a credit card just virtually and you were not issuing a credit card physically at all, right? Uh, but, and I did that at uh, uh, at my previous org. Uh, the difference in activation rates is 10x different. If you issue a, a user a physical card, the activations are 10x higher than just issuing a digital card. And when it comes to spends on those cards, if you have issued a user a physical card, the spends are 4x higher uh, for the, than just issuing a digital card. So as of today, uh, the card form factor is not going up. That's the first. That's the first point that I strongly believe in, and uh, and while its usage is on decline, the physical card is becoming less important. And with uh, with factors like uh, you know you can just um, put your card on your phone, right, and make it an FC enabled, tokenize it, right. The card form factor is becoming less and less important, so that if you're physically present, you can just tap your phone, and it will be on a continuous decline. What's fundamentally more important than the card factor is the credit line issued. In my mind, payments are of two types. Either they're coming from a bank account or they're coming from a credit line. I think, I think in the last five years, while overall digital payments have exploded, uh, and particularly P2M payments, person to merchant payments have exploded and grown more than four or five X, the share of credit led payments, where those payments were done by a credit instrument has declined by more than half. And this is very counterintuitive, right? If you are getting free credit to pay for payments, why should it decline? It declined because the number of credit card issued or credit lines issued or buy now pay letters issued, all of these, right, are, are not adequate enough. So, so there's a huge opportunity in the market to issue more credit lines. At the same time, the physical card form factor uh, is here, it will decline, but it will be a gradual decline. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you will be relevant not just five years from now, but even 10 years from now, uh, in my opinion. No, that's that's the great great perspective, and I think you know these stats on the physical card and uh, you know the activation and spends is is is, is a terrific insight. And thanks thanks for sharing that, uh, Pravina. Why don't I um, you know kind of uh, you know kind of link this with with what's happening on UPI? And do you think if 
uh, Nitin talked about, you know, not adequate credit lines. If, you know, a greater linkage between UPI and credit, you think could further into that, right? I mean, are there, what are the plans uh, as far as credit on UPI is concerned and progress there, which could, which could make a significant dent to that? Yeah, I can see Pankaj grinning there. We'll be talking about all these nice ideas. <laughs> but uh, so that's, I mean, obviously very exciting. But let me let me just look at what options we have today, right? So on one hand, you have the credit card, which is a credit on cards. On the other side, you have a pay later kind of product. Now, whether it's on UPI or some other rails, you know, let's keep it at a slightly generic level for now. So if you got pay later, you know, ideally it is opening up an entire new segment that did not exist earlier because the, the card is a slightly higher uh, cost of acquisition. Nitin spoke about it. You get a higher, uh, you know, activation when you have a physical card, which means you need an acquisition, you need a, uh, you need an issuance of a physical card of a certain quality. It needs to last and sit in your wallet and be used for five years, three years, etc. Right? So it, 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 it needs a certain quality and hence it has a certain cost. And typically, it's associated with slightly higher credit lines, right? It can be a corporate card or a commercial card. You know, it can have even like few lakhs, a crore, etc. Um, or retail. You know, retail. Uh, given the the cost of the card, the cost of managing the entire infrastructure. You know, typically, an issuer will look at at least a, 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 a lakh or plus or fifty thousand or something like that. Right? Slightly on the on the higher side. What the digital credit, a pay later kind of a concept, gives you is the ability to go micro. You know, you can give ten thousand bucks, five thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, thousand bucks, right? So you can give, you can give credit now, instantly, at the point of requirement. You don't have to like block off a big line against a certain customer or or, or a portfolio, and uh, you can also then service the kind of customers who probably earlier were not considered to be credit worthy when it came to larger lines having to be associated with them. So suddenly it just opens up, you know, two axes. It opens up. Uh, a wide range of customers who were uh, not in the fray, so opens the you know, increases the addressable market, and uh, it opens up the uh, the convenience and how the customer wants to use it. So it is on need, on demand. Uh, you know, again going back to this great world of instant, which is the way digital is going to happen, right? Uh, so to me, I mean, these tick some great boxes. I think uh, it's a game changer, but I don't believe it's one or the other. The the, the physical. Uh, form factor of the card will have a space. The card will go sit on the phone, and that will have a space. The pure digital will have a space. Uh, and you know, in a billion or three customers that we you know are addressing, trying to address in in the country, all three of them you know will coexist. And we are long way away from saying it is this or that. So I, I'll come in here a bit. Uh, I, I hope I'm audible. I'm checking again. Yes, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, so to add to what Pravina and Nitin was saying, I think uh, all of us know these numbers, the 80 crore, you know, debit card number or the 5 crore credit card number, 5 and a half crore credit card number. I think the real uh, game changer would be that, you know, considering the 14 to 15 crore, you know, UPI base of customers that are there, how can you use the transactions that are coming in from UPI in terms of both velocity, in terms of both value and create some kind of a credit line which Nitin was saying. The other thing which is very important is that, you know, while you build this, Another, uh, you know, thing as a banker, when I look at, you know, uh, when you look at credit, you know, specifically, the good thing here is that although the line is very small, it is very purpose based. So to that extent, it's for a specific purpose that, you know, you, uh, you know, give the line. So the usage is, you know, kind of fixed. Uh, uh, the other things that, you know, will, that will need to evolve over a period of time is one on compliance, for example. This entire thing works because there is something called a GKYC and, you know, up to 60,000 rupees, typically the, the, you know, guidelines allow you to do a, a terminal kind of a product. And, you know, everybody has done their own interpretation and done this product, you know, in some of the other ways. I think on that side as well, that guideline is of 2015. So I think there also, there needs to be some progression. So, that, you know, it, you know, uh, allows us a certain amount of leeway. And the last thing which is there is, uh, Arpit, uh, that if you see BNPL, and if you see the worldwide market, and if you see, you know, where it has picked up, picked up and essentially China, where it has picked up, where essentially it's a closed, closed loop kind of a system. The cost of uh, not paying in that entire ecosystem is extremely, extremely high because then you are actually a loner. If you're not part of Tencent, if you're not part of Alibaba or Ant, then you are out of the entire system. Well, that will not be the case here. So the cost of collection for a micro line is not what, you know, we've been able to crack as bankers, you know, till now. Uh, it is, it is beastly expensive. 
so you know how do they how do you make that happen and you know how can you make sure that the entire ecosystem uh, uh, is so compulsive that somebody doesn't want to leave that you know ecosystem is a very critical point for this product to you know succeed in times to come i thought i'll just add my two bits uh, to the conversation no, no, absolutely mangesh thanks thanks for doing that really uh, really really interesting thoughts and uh, i think uh, i think the mm-hmm. message is uh, I, i don't think most is something uh, i had a line here I think one of the use cases, which is a really low-hanging fruit, which has not been tackled yet, is why is it that my that using my credit card, I can't scan a QR uh, and pay from my credit line. Uh, I think I think the existing banks today have been waiting for the interchange from NPCI to get solved there, uh, and it's my genuine appeal that to treat P2M UPIs scan payments just like bill payments, forget the interchange, and just make lives easier of the customer. And allow the credit line to be used to scan a QR code. That's my appeal to both Pankaj and Sanjeev. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> Nitin, thanks. You know, thanks. Thanks for that, Sanjeev. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think I'll come in. First, I would have actually loved to debate somebody saying cards will go away. Nobody said that actually. <laughs> I think I would have loved to debate that view, but I didn't get that view. <laughs> okay, my personal view, and I've had it. Uh, you know, a lot of people keep asking, will cards go away? I, Before cards go away, if at all, I don't see it going away, frankly. But let's say in a 20-year horizon or whatever. Before that happens, I do see the machine going away, the EDC machine. Uh, that's my take on it because uh, what we need to crack is essentially can it be done on a mobile or a non-NFC? Any every time that it can be secure. I think that's one thing we need to crack. Once you crack it, uh, and you are able to crack it for solutions which are either uh, powered by 2G, 4G network, etc., or normal, I think if that happens faster, I think then That will pave the way to the cards going away. Personally, my view is cards is not only a usage device; it's also your brand and the customer's wallet. People don't talk about okay. People talk about home loan being from Axis Bank, ICICI. People don't talk about they talk about which card. It's an Axis Bank Vistara card. It's an Axis Bank Flipkart card that I have. So that brand is also that card size is also your brand and the customer's wallet. There are various reasons it has not gone away in US, any country. I do see that staying uh, in India as well. Third point, I think we should realize credit cards is actually the cheapest, not the costliest as people believe. It's the cheapest form of credit because if you are a transactor, you actually literally pay nothing at all. That is not true for a BNPL. That is not true for any other form of buy now pay later product because when you do the transaction, you pay something. Uh, we have to understand that point, and for various reasons, therefore, I see credit cards continuing. Uh, yeah, the country is large. The country is complex. And the country is underpenetrated. So, lot of fun. Thank, thank you for sharing those thoughts. I think, I think uh, clearly, um, I think uh, uh, consistent view that there are some inherent advantages of uh, you know in, uh, advantages of cards which uh, will ensure that uh, you know that form factor never goes away. And uh, you know that's that's great to hear because all kinds of flexible products are needed for such a large country and large uh, ecosystem, right? Uh, so, no, that's that's great to hear. Interestingly, we had a poll while all of you were answering that uh, what is. For this audience who's here, their preferred mode, uh, Pravina, sixty-five percent said UPI, and about thirty-two percent debit and credit. Right. And there was one percent, and there was one percent net banking and cash also. So very, you know, that was the that was the feedback from this, uh, you know, from this audience. Uh, uh, thank you, audience, for uh, you know participating in that. Uh, let me change gears and you know uh, talk about something which I think is. So we we we've talked about a lot of uh, conveniences that digital payments have driven. I think one area where I feel uh is you know that area is yet to be conquered is cross border i think it's still costly still uncomfortable for people you know when they're trying to make a big cross border transfer etc uh uh so uh, i think that's an area i think which which still is a concern pankaj i wanted to kind of maybe start off with you and get your thoughts on you know what can what what can you know we do to kind of make that uh, frictionless or at least less friction than what it is today so thanks arpit i think uh, when we look at uh, cross border arpit mm-hmm. i think we need to look at the cross border market uh, essentially in three large segments you know so and if you talk about the numbers also about 80 billion us dollars of capital account about 970 billion us dollars of export import which is b2b you know kind of a segment and 80 billion which is the invert remittances you know business all of us you know know uh, what is accounted for in the banking system within this also you need to see the points that you are mentioning about cost and efficiency what proportion of business is today happening customer to customer what is customer to business and what is b2b if you look at you know these three you know large segments within this entire uh, business 
which caters to 95% of the total business. Uh, why I am getting these three segments here, the B2B, C2B and C2C, because in all the three, the dimensions are very different. So when you look at B2B, which is the largest portion of this entire segment, and you know, uh, lots of that I handle uh, in, in my side, then I handle small businesses, uh, which is the MSME, you know, which contributes to about 40% of India's exports. There, I think the game changer is all about turnaround time. So people value turnaround time most over price. That is, you know, the valuable insight which you get when you look at B2B business. When you look at, you know, possibly C2C, which is the most expensive when it comes to cost, uh, I think their cost becomes, you know, very, very critical. What is today complex and why has it not been conquered? I think very simple. I think there are three things which uh, are very critical. If you see this entire space, there is no common regulator. So you have different regulators, you know, in different countries. There is no single global payment system which is existing in the world. So, you know, most of the banks will have to go through a SWIFT, you know, for example, typically for the B2B business. And third is, there are no global standards that are uniform in every country. So, these three are all divergent, which is not the case in domestic. And, you know, for consumers like you and me, we would always want to juxtapose the experiences that we have in our domestic payments to cross-border payments also. I would want to have a UPI kind of a transaction or an RTGS kind of a transaction when I do cross-border. So I think because of these three, uh, you know, elements, which I spoke of, currently we have not been able to conquer this. You know, what we can do, you know, uh, uh, you are representing, a, a, you know, a payment provider, a fintech, you know, essentially what banks can do, what the regulator can do and what does the government, you know, all the four essentially need to do some of the other thing. Of course, there are uh, corridors also which can happen between countries to make sure that, you know, all these four get sorted. But broadly, uh, I, I think two or three things which will certainly help. And there is some headway uh, when it comes to the B2B business. I think that and I was speaking about the turnaround time there. Uh, today, if there is a uh, importer right in India and he has to you know make a payment outside you know to a supplier uh, you know uh, he's supplying something to the US. If he's making a payment on Monday, then most likely the month the payment is getting settled to that you know customer in the US on Tuesday, right? Minimum that is Tuesday or Wednesday is the time when the you know money is coming because there are correspondent banks also involved and everybody. It's actually like, you know, everybody is benefiting in the transaction. So therefore also the transaction becomes very costly. So if there is something like, let's say a visa B2B, for example, something which visa has done, or for example, something which ICICI bank has done, where, you know, we've, we've kind of introduced something called as trade online, which ensures that hundred percent of the transactions today on cross border can actually be done online completely with no branch interaction. So something in that direction, when a global network player, you know, comes into place, and make sure that the transactions become instant is I think going to be a game changer there. That is, you know, uh, one dimension of the entire uh, uh, space there. The, the other part is that, you know, how can you make sure that all the different players in this space, so you have a logistics player, you have a freight forwarder, you have a customs, you have a regulator, you have a bank. So these are the minimum, you know, five people who are there in this business. And six, of course, is the place of discovery. So what we saw in Alibaba where, you know, people are trying to discover the exporter and importer also discover businesses on their platform. So all the six, if they can come on a DLT or a blockchain, then it is going to make sure that the entire transaction is going to be super, super efficient and super seamless. And you have some examples of, you know, in Singapore, for example, uh, there is a fintech which is called Camel One, which has been able to achieve this, uh, you know, in Singapore. Got it. Got it. So I think Thanks. if that gets made here in India, a blockchain kind of a piece, you know, comes in India, we've made some, you know, taken some steps on the, in that direction. But for that, everybody has to come together and that is, you know, itself a time-taking exercise like so, you saw earlier. So, so, so what I'm hearing is not, not an easy one to solve for. <laughs> lots, of, lots of participants need to come together. Uh, Praveena, uh, you know, what is what is NPCI, uh, you know, thinking about that, right? I know I know uh, there was some talk of some kind of corridors being created, maybe not, not, not particularly all countries, but maybe some particular corridors. I know NPCI is also thinking about, you know, taking UPI and, you know, Rupee Global, uh, you know, with some you know, some plans around that. Uh, do you think if any of that materializes with for some corridors, you know, it could become like a UPI kind of experience cross border at some stage, uh, you know, uh, maybe not now, but in the coming years? So, Arpit, I think uh, clearly that's the gold standard uh, to be achieved for international payments, right? So, from there, perhaps most of the transactions are today in what we call TTs, you know, that, that take, uh, you know, tens of dollars in terms of cost, it takes you know a couple of days in terms of time, um, with, two, with little information that is available, you know, did my transaction reach, not reach, etc. So there's an information deficit there. So faster, better, cheaper is, is certainly the direction to go. 
And today, you know, we do have something called the foreign inward remittance uh, product on UPI. So, you know, UPI can connect seamlessly with the rails, uh, inward rails. Um, so, providing an end-to-end flow. So, the domestic leg is instant on, on the back of UPI. UPI ID can be provided by an international uh, player on a portal, providing a seamless, you know, end-to-end uh, experience. Uh, and slowly, we, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, banks that are uh, going live. In fact, the domestic system is live. Some of the international linkages are, are yet to be made, but this is currently already uh, something in play. And what do we have today? You know, we have, uh, we have uh, an environment where the friction is caused in two ways. Right? One is in terms of the correspondent banking network. So there's a international bank, you know, with a domestic partner, and then there is a there is a domestic leg. So this can certainly be addressed through the bilateral engagements that you spoke about, and NPCI under NPCI International Private Limited is certainly in the midst of that. We also need to solve for some of the friction elements like sanction screening. Right? So there are some uh, some international uh, requirements on compliances. India has a fairly stringent uh, regulatory regime in terms of both outward and inward purpose of the payment, uh, you know, uh, um, consolidated limits for every individual in terms of how much of uh, outward payment can be made. So certain requirements are there from an India perspective as well and certain common utility tools uh, will go a long way. So some thoughts that are there, you know, that, that we would be uh, looking at and looking to solve internationally. I was on a, on a panel with uh, the global CEO of SWIFT and, you know, they are looking at how they can put a utility in place at the international level for, let's say, sanction screening. So I think all of these coming together with the foray of uh, NPCI uh, to look at uh, not just bilateral engagements, but this could span the whole hog from, uh, from transporting our uh, tech stack on UPI, uh, you know, creating corridors of uh, the foreign inward and outward remittances uh, on, on UPI or, or products like Rupee. Uh, and more importantly, creating uh, larger network opportunities. So I think all these are very much on the play. Uh, announcement, for example, with Singapore is already there in, in public domain, and many more are in process, which you know I, I can't divulge too much of details about. But I think we are uh, in a in a very good place, um, and this will create solid benefit uh, for you know, of course, our, uh, our bankers. They'll be able to provide those end-to-end solutions far more seamlessly. Uh, and users, you know, users from India to India in the way they are able to make a transaction. So if somebody is sitting overseas can use a UPI ID, uh, you know, validate the ID saying it's correct and make a, a, a debit happening, you know, somewhere in the US and in the same, uh, within three seconds, a credit happening in India with a notification going to both parties. I mean, that, then we really achieved uh, that goal and uh, we are heading in that direction. No, that's 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 great to hear. Uh, you know, so hopefully, hopefully, with you know banks and NPCI and fintech players like us, we can create those solutions for the customers, which uh, can can drive that uh, you know next uh, you know uh, you know next next stage of uh, convenience for the customers and merchants. Um, uh, let me uh, let me let me change change gears a bit and talk about uh, coming back to you know domestic payments. Uh, but I want to talk about. Uh, uh, RBI and what they've done uh, with NEFT and RTGS as far as uh, you know 24 by 7 uh, payments are concerned, right? I think about a year ago, uh, I think about uh, you know for NEFT, uh, you know 24 7 uh, was introduced. I think the uptick on that has been, I think, moderate uh, if I can say that. Uh, and I know despite you know despite that, I think RBI, I think it being being a, you know being being very proactive and has now said you know 24 by 7 on RTGS as well. Uh, I'd love to, you know, love to get uh, maybe first Nitin's reaction on, on what he thinks about, you know, you know, twenty four seven and what if if that was to pick up, what would you know, what that would what what that would mean for customers, and then I want to hear from the banks, right, Pankaj and Sanjeev, why do you think, you know, why do you think the banks have been a little slow in, if I can use the word, uh, you know, uh, reacting to that? Uh, so Nitin, maybe first I hear from you, and then kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, throw it, throw it to Pankaj and Sanjeev. Yeah, yeah. So, if you think about 24/7 payments, right? UPI uh, was already 24/7, and well, IMPS was 24/7. I think, and IMPS by the way had a very slow adoption. Unless there was a the UPI layer, the adoption layer, the use case layer was very smoothly put on top of it. The there was a real sort of convenience on top of it, and that's when like it exploded. And uh, UPI being 24/7, I think the limit there is 50,000 rupees. You could transfer money up to 50,000 rupees quite seamlessly. The bulk of volume got captured there anyway. Right. So small payments, P2P payments, uh, small P2M payments, right? So so the, the bulk of use cases got captured there. 
I think the point of view where RBI came from is that in any when you're building infrastructure, right? That infrastructure or any utility should work all the time. There is no reason why things should not work on weekends. There was a point of time when these things needed manual intervention, and people work five days a week, so that's why it worked five days or you know working days. Uh, but now infrastructure is electronic work is automatic and therefore any infrastructure utility should work 24 7. that's how rbi would approach anything when they're coming and solving a problem from an adoption point of view the use case that was solving was for uh, transfers which were more than fifty thousand rupees right uh, and these transfers were few and that's why i think the moderate the success has been moderate that way but what you see is that whenever infrastructure gets built Eventually, use cases get built which make that more seamless. Those use cases I am less aware of today, and I am hoping that uh, Pankaj and Sanjeev might have more insights. Uh, but those use cases, when they will arrive, right? That's when this twenty-four-seven will see significant success. In absence of the use cases, it will see moderate success because UPI was already solving for it. But from an RBS perspective, they have to build infra, and infra means twenty-four-seven utility, right? Working all the time. That that's my that's my view. Uh, thanks, Nitin. To me, Arpit, I think uh, what you know, Nitin kind of added. So when when there's a full debate, which uh, which always happens between accelerating digital payments, three things which you know differentiate a cash versus a digital is speed, the cost, and also access. There are you know many more play things like universality, universality, or you know fungibility, you know so on and so forth. But I think these three things, speed, cost, and access, very very critical. And I think. Uh, in speed and both cost, I think both the uh, modes, NEFT and RTGS, of course, they click the button as far as speed and cost is you know concerned. Uh, to the question as to you know why has it not scaled up, I I, so I agree with uh, Nitin. See, we we are here to provide the railroad essentially, and we are also looking at use cases of you know what people can come up with on the larger payments, which is the B two B. Like for example, Reserve Bank came to us, came to SSI Bank and said. Look, solve you know solve this problem because we are doing settlements throughout the day, and we need an NFT to you know make that happen. So we have kind of made it happen for you. We are in the process of you know making it uh, happen for you. Uh, to me, uh, certain things will get questioned today. For example, just imagine today mutual fund, you know mutual fund redemption. So there is a cut off time which is actually there. Now once this railroad gets built, tomorrow you know somebody might say that at 7 p.m. in the night I want to you know redeem and I want to get a settlement today. Today that was that could not happen. So all those things will start getting questioned with the railroad getting built of RTS and NFT. And uh, let, let us not say that it was NFT first and RTGS second, because to me, somewhere these are backup systems of the regulator. So if NFT was there, RTS had to come. You know, in times right. of it had to come. So it came. And uh, we are, you know, looking forward to, like Nitin said, more and more use cases coming, you know, to us to, you know, make that work. Uh, frankly speaking, there's no restriction, you know, in terms of, you know, our prioritization that, you know, we have to push towards an IMPS payment. When somebody is asking for NFT and RTS payment, that's not what you know we are looking at. There is obviously uh, at the end, I would want to say that you know there's a treasury leg to it also. Sure. We sure. Also, know yeah. after a certain point of time, the corporate is not sitting and you know doing fund transfers for you beyond yeah. a point. That's not yeah. how yeah. this is happening today. But yeah, if there is just the way you know uh, any new innovation uh, has to get accelerated possibly by an event or by by something which changes in the ecosystem, possibly the shakeup is required here. You know, uh, you know, for all of us to also see. What D twenty four by seven RTGS and NFT will mean for us in times to come. No thanks. Thanks for your thoughts. I think I've uh, you know uh, this has been a very engaging discussion, and uh, I think we used up a lot of time. So I'm going to move to this uh, one last question from me, and hopefully we might have some time for a question from the audience. But I want to ask this last question to all of you, Sanjeev. I'll start with you. Um, uh, you know, short answer. You know, what's what's one big innovation in you know payments that you're Working on or wishing for, right? That you think could 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 drive the ecosystem in the coming year. So, since you start with you, uh, uh, Praveena, Nitin, and Pankaj. After that, very right? short answers, please. Okay. Uh, if you would ask me, uh, I would be more most excited about two things. One is a voice-based payments mechanism. Uh, that's what most of India would be very comfortable with. So, not QR. Obviously, whatever exists can exist, but voice-based payment for the customer. Second is if actually you can do all your transactions at the merchant without an ADC in between. Uh, these are two innovations that I would like to see, we like to work on. I think uh, my pick would be these two. Thanks, thanks, Sanjeev. 
Pravina? Yeah, just as I was formulating my ranking, I think Sanjeev uh, stole my point. Uh, so I, I, I vote for <laughs> voice-based payments, uh, you know, sometimes we call it feature feature phone payments, but I, I like to call it voice-based payments. Uh, feature phone doesn't do justice to what it can do in today's right. world of uh, voice bots and uh, AI and voice recognition. I think uh, uh, we, we should be quite close, you know, next year we should look at uh, voice-based payments for ourselves in the ecosystem. Is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I think this uh, I think this ability to get rid of the EDC machine or anything which identifies a merchant is very powerful, right? Visa network the the EDC machines I remember at one point time were a million strong, then they became three million strong. Then QR codes came in, they expanded. Right? If you can get rid of all this, and let's say the merchant face is good enough to make a payment, uh, right? Uh, you just see a merchant, you open your phone, scan the face, and the payment goes through from your phone, right? You have removed all in between infrastructure. Uh, that is needed to identify a merchant. I think that makes all merchants uh, electronic transaction ready immediately. That I think in my mind, uh, I would love to see. No, that's, the, that's a great thought, Nathan. Pankaj, I know the last one is you know, probably the most difficult since people have uh, shared a lot of their <laughs> ideas. <laughs> so so, I, 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 so I'm, I'm glad that somebody did not steal one of my points. <laughs> stolen. But uh, I'll just say, uh, Swarpik, the, the concept uh, for me, so anything which minimizes the three C's, which is cash, check and courier. I think these three things, if something minimizes, is really the dream, if you ask me. And in that context, uh, you know, two things. Uh, one is I would want to, and we are actually, uh, NPC is at the verge of cracking the feature phone on UPI in a very large way. So I am, you know, looking forward to that happening in a very, very, very big way. The second thing is platformization in cross-border that I spoke of. What I saw of what's happening in Singapore, if that was a reality here, then I think our contribution as a country to the overall uh, ecosystem as far as uh, exports and imports will grow multifold. I think we are way off in terms of getting all the ecosystem players, which is the logistics player, the regulator, the government, the banks, and also the discovery platforms on one single platform. And that can just you know change the gear as far as cross-border is concerned. So I think these two things is what you know I would uh, really look forward to. So I think uh, you know some great thoughts uh, from the panel. I think uh, lots of lots of ideas for uh, you know uh, fintech players out there to uh, you know uh, pick up on and solve uh, solve some these use cases which could which could drive uh, you know which could drive innovation um, i think uh, uh, i'm i'm getting messages that uh, you know we i've used up uh, you know the, the time that i had uh, you know thank you so much for uh, such a oh, that's a technical failure for sure thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> We wait for Arpit to come back. Yes. Well, Arpit. Uh, sorry, we just you know uh, technical glitch. So just just uh, sorry, as I was thanking you. Thank you so much for an insightful uh, uh, you know discussion and frank discussion. Uh, was my uh, my uh, you know want to uh, thank you all on behalf of Razorpay. Um, you know. Uh, Please uh, please stay around. There's some interesting uh, you know panel uh, panels uh, planned for the rest of the day. And uh, uh, thanks again for taking the time. Thank you so much, Arpit. Thanks, Kavina, Sanjeev, Nitin. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. 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 Bye